You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is David Henderson. He is a research fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and an associate professor of economics at the Naval Postgraduate School. David, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thanks, Garrett. And by the way, my bio is slightly out of date. There's some good news here. I was promoted about two months ago to full professor. Oh, great. (laughs) Our topic today is uh, perhaps the most controversial topic of the past few years, at least in economics, and that is inequality. Of course, last year, Thomas Piketty wrote his book, or released his book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, which quite unprecedentedly uh, was the number one Amazon bestseller, because, I suppose, because of this uh, inequality issue and because he's writing about that. Do you want to comment on the popularity of that book? Uh, Yeah, and I gave a speech about it, about inequality, in which I referred in, in large parts of the speech to the book by Piketty, and I pointed out that uh, there was this uh, mathematician at the University of Wisconsin, uh, you, you, you talked about it being a bestseller, uh, I pointed out that doesn't, that doesn't mean it was a best reader. In other words, it wasn't the case that people were actually reading it. And here's what this mathematician did. He, let me, let me find, his name was Jordan Ellenberg, University of Wisconsin, and he checked the five passages of, of Piketty's book that were most highlighted on Kindle and found that the last of the five was on page 26 Hmm. of this almost 700-page book. So I pointed, I said in my speech, it appears that people read enough of Piketty's book to use his views as backing for beliefs that they already hold. And then that gets to a more general point, or or a more fundamental point, which is, why are we seeing this discussion? Why are we seeing so much discussion of inequality and I think it started in the early 1990s when the Democrats, Al Gore especially, and then again, again he stepped it up again in 2000, were talking about the top 1%. And they just, just focused on that and focused and focused and focused. And I do think politicians every once in a while can influence the debate. And I think he did, Sylvia Nasser, who was an economics reporter and was sometimes a friend of mine at the New York Times, uh, had a, an important article on it in the early 90s that was highly misleading, but nevertheless, it helped set, set the stage for this discussion. And I think Obama, I think one of the things he is most passionate about is having higher taxes and high-income people. And by stepping up the rhetoric and just talking about it again and again, I think he had an effect. And so I think that's part. So in other words, I don't think the Piketty thing is as much the cause of it as a response. In other words, I think people have gotten very interested in this idea. And here Piketty comes along and hits it right at the crest of the wave. And I think that explains the huge sales of the book. It seems like people have always been, or for at least you know, a century, at least since Karl Marx, I should say, been interested in things related to inequality, ideas of uh, class struggle or, or differences in, in power. Uh, but now it's very much a focus on statistical inequality, especially income inequality. How do you think the different forms of inequality relate? There's inequality in wealth, income, power, political influence. Okay, so let's first of all distinguish, I want to make two distinctions between inequality of, of income and inequality of wealth, and then between those inequalities and inequality of power. So first of all, income, of course, has to do with our income, what we take in every year, whether in wages or dividends or interest, which is the three main ways almost all of us get our income. And, and actually, lower-income people often get it in welfare, so I should put that in. And actually, older people often get it in Social Security payments and so on. So, so those, those, that's income. So that's a, an annual measure. And then there's wealth. And wealth ideally should include not just the market value of your assets, but also the present value of the stream of future income that you are likely to get. But we don't generally do that last part. It's hard to compute for many people. 
but still, the point is that wealth inequality is not the same as income inequality. I live in Pacific Grove, California. Right next to me is Pebble Beach. There are people in Pebble Beach who own houses worth $2 million free and clear. They've paid the mortgage. They're maybe 67 years old. And they're getting Social Security income, dividend income, and interest income of maybe $40,000 a year. If you look at them on the income scale, they're in the bottom. They're in the second quintile from the bottom. But it's absurd to say that they're poor. They're wealthy because they've got an asset worth $2 million and no big debts. And so it's really important to distinguish between income inequality and wealth inequality. Also, if you just look at the major factor in both income inequality and wealth inequality is age. People start out working, generally making relatively low income. They acquire skills and experience, and their income goes up. People also save. And due to the power of compound interest, which Albert Einstein was alleged to have said is the most powerful force in nature, they accumulate wealth. And if you look at just, let's say everyone of a certain age had the same wealth as everyone else at that age. Mm -hmm. Even with that, you'd have huge wealth inequality just because of age. So you have people in their 60s with roughly 20 times the wealth of people in their 20s and early 30s. And so age is a major factor. And so when people are asked, what do you think is the ideal level of wealth inequality? They're actually answering from a level of profound ignorance. They probably haven't thought about it. And there's a tendency to think, well, there should be a certain amount of equality, but they don't think about age differences. And so they will actually add answer, and there's this famous video on this on YouTube, where they answer that the, amount, the ideal amount of wealth inequality is much less than it turns out we have. But again, they haven't really thought about it. They haven't thought about the fact that age is such an important factor in both income inequality and even more so in wealth inequality. Now to the distinction between inequality in income or wealth and inequality in political power. It's certainly true that political power is correlated with wealth. All other things equal, the wealthier you are, the more political power you have. But the correlation is by no means perfect. My favorite example of this is Bill Gates in 1998. Here was a man who set up a very successful firm in one state. So he had two senators on his side out of 100. So when the Justice Department went after him with its antitrust suit, he didn't have anyone other than those two senators defending him. And he had very little political power. He learned his lesson. Now Microsoft spends all kinds of money on lobbying. But at the time, he had very little political power, even though he was either the wealthiest or the second wealthiest person in the United States at the time. On the other hand, you can have people who are, say, in the bottom, or the second quintile from the bottom, who organize through labor unions or whatever, and they have a fair amount of political power. I go to, and I hate doing this, but sometimes I go to local city council meetings when I want to speak up on an issue. And there are people there who can just stop someone from building a house. And these are not wealthy people, but they can make enough of a stink that the person doesn't get to build a house or doesn't get to put on an extra bathroom or doesn't get to cut down a tree. They have political power, and it's not very correlated with their wealth. So Joseph Stiglitz has a a book arguing against inequality. I can't remember the title right now, but he he makes a big point of this, that uh, it's one dollar, one vote, and and make, makes the case for wealth redistribution largely on a, on a sort of rent-seeking argument that, the, that uh, not only does political power allow, or not only does wealth allow people to be more effective rent-seekers, but 
you know, high levels of wealth are the result of rent seeking. Do you want to comment on that? Um, to some extent, it's true. Um, the example, in fact, I gave in my talk that I gave in Switzerland last month, I'm in a group that benefits in a big way. Um, I'm in the top fifth, both income and wealth. I'm probably in the top tenth in wealth, I'm not sure, um, because of my age. Uh, but I'm in a group that benefits big time from government restrictions in California. As I mentioned, it's very hard to build a house anymore in California. That restriction in supply has made house prices very high. And the restrictions have grown over time, meaning that when I bought my house in 1986, it was restricted. But it's even more restricted now. So supply has not gone up the way one might have expected. So we've had a windfall. Now, you ask people in my wealth category who own a house in coastal California whether they favor allowing more houses to be built, and I would bet 80% of them will say absolutely not. And they have an effect, as I mentioned. So, yeah, they are rent seekers. They're seeking to preserve their rents, and that's bad. And so my solution is don't tax them more. That doesn't solve anything. Just get rid of those restrictions or at least relax those restrictions. And that's why I gave a talk to a bunch of developers a few years ago on this, and I said that they essentially are the proxy for renters, that renters should love them because the more they get to build houses, the more prices come down. And um, I think, I mean, that's basic econ 101 reasoning. I think Stiglitz couldn't find much fault with it. But that's not, of course, what he's getting at. But that he's right that a lot of wealth is due to political power. And so then the question, the thing to do is look at the particular sources and change those. I, I definitely know from whenever I follow local politics that the developers are always cast as the bad guys. But, of course... It'd be very hard to cast uh, poor people who just want to rent apartments as the bad guys, and when they have this proxy, it it makes them uh, an easy target. I think the the maybe the big issue that people are concerned about is the allegation that the the sort of middle class or the the average guy has not seen an increase in his wealth since the 1970s, whereas the the one percent or the top or CEOs or whoever have seen it increase dramatically. I I know that that's what uh, Piketty and Sayers uh, purport to show, but I've seen other arguments from uh, notably Berkhauser, I think, uh, arguing that, in fact, that isn't the case. So uh, how about you comment on the trend in inequality? Berkhauser's right. That isn't the case. I mean, first of all, even the standard ways you inflation adjust show that the incomes of people in all categories have gone up over the last 40 years. They've gone up more slowly than the incomes of people in the top 1%. But there's something else going on there that needs to be pointed out. Only 1% of people can fit in the top 1%. So if incomes are going up a lot at, uh, for, for high-income people, the cutoff for you to be in the 1% goes up. And so you can get the mistaken impression that everyone in the 1% had their income go up. No, the incomes went up so much that the cutoff for the top 1% was higher. And uh, there, you know that just that's just a, a statistical fact. Alan Reynolds has actually done a very good job of pointing this out in a, a book called Income and Wealth. And so, so anyway, back to the other people in the in the bottom, say four fifths, their incomes have gone up too, not as quickly. Two things about that: that's done using the imperfect measure we have for the consumer price index to adjust for inflation. And my Hoover colleague, Mike Boskin, was head of a Senate-created committee in the mid-'90s that found that the consumer price index overstates the inflation rate by about a percentage point to two percentage points a year. Now, that's not a percent. That'd be nothing. It's a percentage point. So if it's a percentage point a year over 20 years with compounding, that's about 21 or 22%. And so you inflation adjusts correctly 
and it shows that people in the bottom four-fifths have done much better. They haven't done maybe as much better as we might like them to do, but they've definitely done much better. It's just not true that their incomes have stagnated. And, and also you can see that just by looking at what they have. Look at what's in the house. Michael Cox and Richard Alm have a book called Myths of Rich and Poor, where they look at what people have in their houses. And in the mid-'90s, they pointed out that in the mid-'90s, people in the bottom fifth had the same things that people in the middle-income category had in the early 1970s. So one generation later, what the bottom fifth had was roughly what the middle class had 25 years later. Now, that's huge progress. The second point is that we have to adjust for the composition of the household, and that's changed dramatically. Uh, there's an economist who does a blog at American Enterprise Institute, Carpe Diem, and his name's not coming to mind, but anyway, he does this blog, oh, Mark Perry, and he looks at what about individual incomes, and individual incomes have gone up, even though sometimes household incomes haven't gone up as much. And why would that be? Well, as people get wealthier, they split. So you have... Uh, Maybe, in the, say, 40 years ago, older parents living with their adult children, and then the older parents are doing well enough, they split and go out on their own, or the adult children go out on their own. Either way, the point is that household splits. Now incomes are lower, and everyone's better off, assuming the split was voluntary. Incomes are lower for the household. For the household, because, see, let's say you had... 180,000 for the household of four people, and they split, and then one household has 50,000 and one has 30,000. That looks bad on paper, but if the adult children wanted their parents to leave, and if the parents wanted to leave, it's good. Right. They're consuming more, really. They have now two places to live instead of one. Yes, right. And there's also the technology issue that I'm calling you right now through an iPhone, which nobody had 20 years ago. That's right. That's right. And like one thing, one of my favorite parts of Greg Mankiw's textbook in economics is where he kind of, he, he kind of asks the question, are you richer than Rockefeller? And so he points out that, you know, look at what Rockefeller had and, and then look at what you have. For most of his life, John D. Rockefeller, who was the wealthiest man in, in the world at the time, uh, didn't have air conditioning. He didn't have television. He never had television. For most of his life, he couldn't travel by airplane. And more important, he didn't have penicillin. And so virtually everyone has a TV if he or she wants it. Most, the vast majority of people have air conditioning. I don't, but I live in such a moderate climate, I don't need it. The vast majority of people in the South have air conditioning. Uh, we have iPhones. He didn't even have a 1G. And so in some important ways, we are all richer than Rockefeller. But some people might argue that even though we're richer, we still have to sort of support this, this class of one percenters. That c couldn't we do even better if, if the wealth were redistributed? Okay, so if you could tax people in the 1% and not badly distort their incentives and give it to people below that, then, yeah, people below that would be better off. I think you would distort the incentives, so that's more the, ec the economic point. I also think there's a moral point to be made here, which is it's wrong. I mean, you'd want to look at why they got what they got. So Bernie Madoff, the... the uh, Ponzi scheme guy. If you take his wealth, I have no problem with that. He got it dishonestly. But how about the guy who figures out how to produce an aluminum can that has our soda in it and take a little bit of aluminum? I've, I've got a, a soda can right in front of me, and there's this little crease, and I was reading about it in a book a couple of years ago. This guy who figured out how to do that saved fractions of a penny per can but over hundreds of millions of cans made, you know, a, a couple of million dollars in savings. So he made, he used fewer resources, 
he got a benefit from those resources, he became a millionaire, and we're better off. Or another example, think of the guy who invented the chainsaw, at least not not invented the chainsaw, but came up with the one-man chainsaw that was light enough to use easily. It was under 25 pounds, and that was a guy named McCullough. And he did this just after World War II, and he sold over 100,000 of these chainsaws. Think of the effect of that on inequality. It increased inequality. Because virtually everyone who bought a chainsaw was lower income than him to begin with. And then he became much wealthier. So he probably was in the top 1% of the time, at the time. And so he's better off, and they're better off. On the other hand, think of the, the privilege seeker. And the example I gave in my talk in, in Switzerland was a man who, as congressman, started out with virtually nothing, and then protected the Federal Communications Commission from an attack by a powerful congressman on their budget, and as repayment for that favor, a guy at the FCC suggested that his wife buy up this radio station in Austin, Texas. This was in the early 1940s. And the people who've been trying to sell it have been trying for years to sell it, never got the FCC to give permission. Once she applied, once this congressman's wife applied, she got permission almost instantly, within a couple of weeks. And then a few weeks later, she applied to have it have longer hours. They used to restrict hours of radio stations and have a better part of the spectrum. And she got that within a few weeks. And when he ran for president in 1964, Lyndon Johnson, that was the congressman and his wife, had a net worth of $15 million in 1964 dollars, over half of which was just that one asset, the radio station. So there's a guy who was a privilege seeker. He benefited, and, and by the way, he got a relatively restricted radio market in Austin, Texas for decades, so people were slightly worse off, and inequality was higher. So there are two ways you can get higher inequality. The productive person who's producing things people want, and then the privilege seeker who's restricting competition and making other people slightly worse off and himself way better off. And so I just think those are so different, and that different difference matters. So what you're saying is that it's the difference between voluntary and not voluntary ways of redistributing or, or changing the amount of wealth people have, and that's what we should be more concerned about, more so than the this sort of ex post statistic of how much each person has. That's right. That's right. And by the way, if you look at polling data, it is not the case that there are all these middle and lower income Americans out there who are just badly upset because some very wealthy person bought another jet. I think they understand that if you tax that person more, they probably wouldn't see it anyway. They would just go to some other privilege seeker, a lot of it. And so they would much rather have a society in which they can be better off, and that's how m most people think. I believe when uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, when his book was released in English and he started doing talks in America, he that was he had never in France got the question, why should we care about inequality? And I remember seeing pictures of him looking kind of grumpy getting that question in America. Interesting, interesting. So it... It's, it's, I suppose, a cultural difference. Um, it, seems, it seems like in Europe they care more. Yeah, um, and maybe more in France than in other parts of Europe, too. But, by the way, one of the things... I, I did a long book review of Piketty's book for... Is it Piketty or Piketty? Uh, I, think it, I think Piketty. Okay. I did a long review of Piketty's book in Regulation Magazine about a year ago, in which I pointed out that... In a 650-page book, roughly, at no point does he ever say why we should care. He, that's literally the case. He never says why we should care. He just says we should make inequality the central issue of economics, and he never says why. There, there's an Im implicit reason involving social welfare functions, the idea that there's diminishing marginal utility and... So a rich person 
this is of course using a, a sort of concept of utility where it's uh, cardinal and and comparable between people uh, but uh, economists often will create these social welfare functions that are higher when you have less inequality uh, wh- what do you think of those well okay so I, I <laughs> this is how you and I be got in touch a few weeks ago. I wrote a blog post about this that I thought was uncontroversial, and it kicked up this firestorm. And I was just taking it literally that what I learned in my PhD program was correct, that you can't compare utility across people. And basically, people were saying, well, you know, well, some people were saying you can, but the, the one that I think was most persuasive was, well, You can't, but people do, and so let's do it anyway. And I get that. I get that if Bill Gates was walking along and lost a $100 bill, he probably wouldn't notice. If some poor person picked up the $100 bill, he would probably notice. So let's just just take that as a working assumption that 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 money would matter more to the low-income, low-wealth person. The point is, what matters to the low-income, low-wealth person is being better off. And so that's why I like what Robert Solo said in his review in The New Republic of Piketty, of Piketty because Solo directly confronted the issue. Let me read to you from what Solo said. The labor share of national income is arithmetically the same thing as the real wage divided by the productivity of labor. Would you rather live in a society in which the real wage was rising rapidly, but the labor share was falling because productivity was increasing even faster, or one in which the real wage was stagnating along with productivity, so the labor share was unchanging? The first is surely better on narrowly economic grounds. You eat your wage, not your share of national income. But there could be political and social advantages to the second option. If a small class of owners of wealth, and it is small, comes to collect a growing share of the national income, it is likely to dominate the society in other ways as well. In other words, what Solo is saying is there's a good chance that if you get Piketty's proposals on taxes, very high taxes on incomes in excess of 80%, taxes on wealth of as much as of at least 1% of wealth a year above a certain level, then you will reduce inequality. But according to Solo, there's a good chance you'll also reduce the well-being of everyone. And so, for, so in other words, it's not the case that you're just going to take this income and lower-income people are going to be better off. You're going to take the income, it's going to hurt incentives, and lower-income people are going to be worse off. Solo still favors that, which is really striking, but he favors it because he says the small class of owners will come to collect a growing share of national income and dominate the, other, in other, the society in other ways as well. He doesn't specify the ways in which they'll dominate, which is, un, which is expected. It's a book review. But Piketty doesn't either, and his book is over 600 pages long. Piketty and Solo both relate the rich to capital owners. Um, and of course, in Piketty's framework, he has the famous inequality, R is greater than G. Do you want to explain that? Uh, yeah, and I, I have that in my book review, too. Um, so if you have someone whose wealth, he saves all his wealth, and it collects a return of an interest rate, a real interest rate of R, and the G, the growth rate of the economy, is less than R, then he will own an increasing share of, of the economy, because R is less than G, because R is greater than G. But here's the problem. If he spends a certain amount of it so that his net is R minus a number, and that is less than G, so let, let's put numbers in this so it's less abstract. Let's say R is 5% and G is 3%. So the economy's growing at 3%, his wealth is growing at 5%. But now, if he spends more than 2% of it, then his share will not grow. Also, he'll have kids. If he has one kid, and his kid is kind of a miser too, sure, it'll grow. If he has two kids, right away that splits it. If he has three kids, forget it. And then remember, you think about the Kennedys, 
where the father saved a lot of wealth, but the kids spent it. And so over time, it dissipates. It doesn't dissipate is too strong. But over time, they it doesn't work out that rich people own a bigger percent of, of the wealth. And by the way, one of the very striking things in is this guy wrongly, who did a did a talk at Brookings um, about uh, about this issue, and and here's how uh, urban economist Randall O'Toole commented on Wrongly's point on Piketty. Piketty. Here's O'Toole: Is capital income displacing labor income? Asked Wrongly in a Brookings paper. Only if you count housing. As The Economist summarizes Wrongly's results, quote, surging house prices are almost entirely responsible for growing returns on capital, unquote, which means that rising high house prices may be chiefly responsible for rising inequality. As a result, Wrongly concludes, Piketty should have titled his book Housing in the 21st Century. And that gets back to my point about people in coastal California, coastal Washington and Oregon, and the northeastern coast who are getting a huge amount of their wealth due to restrictions on building housing. And of course, there's a big difference between, uh, I think, what we imagine when we think capital. We imagine you're the owner of some some large corporation or, or you have uh, money in a trust fund or, or a hedge fund. But if you are just you just own your house and your house goes up in value, well, you know, if you... You you aren't materially better off until you sell the house and move in you know start renting or move into a less expensive one, uh, but if you if you wanted to uh, keep living in coastal California and still own your house, then there's a sense in which you haven't got wealthier at all. Um, yeah, but the thing is, the services of the house have gone up in value. If you've restricted the supply, the marginal value of the service the house creates is part, is higher. So just by sitting in a house, I'm getting more value from it than I would have 50 years ago. Right, right, because because the, the rent is also higher. Right, and rent reflects what the value people put on it. Right, so you, you might, uh, right, you might, if the, if the, if there were not so many restrictions, you might live in a larger house, you might use more space. If if you could build more skyscrapers, for instance. Oh, that's true too. But that wasn't the point I was making. I was just saying that when you restrict the supply of something, imagine a supply curve mm-hmm. shifting to the left, or alternatively, a supply curve staying in place and the demand curve shifting to the right. The marginal value of the thing goes up, and so I don't have to sell my house to be wealthier. I am wealthier, and I'm just choosing to consume that wealth by staying in the house. And a way to see that is, okay. Yeah, people say you have to live somewhere. Yeah, but I don't have to live in coastal California. I could live in Tennessee, and I could retire today if I sold my house and lived to Tennessee in Tennessee and live very well. So, so the fact that I can do that means my wealth is higher than it would have been without that restriction. Now, this uh, the inequality we've been talking about so far has been all within countries, but I think uh, maybe... An interesting little fact is that inequality, global inequality, has been dramatically decreasing because of the growth of China and India, which I think people are not so aware of. Uh, can you comment on that trend, and do you see it continuing? Uh, yeah, I think it's a really good point. And so, in fact, let me go to this guy who talked about it, this guy, Bronco Milanovic at University of Maryland, basically laid out how the income in the world is becoming substantially more equal, mainly, as you say, because of India and China. I mean, let's face it, that's right there, 2.5 billion people, which is a little over a third of the world. And so if their income is growing, you're gonna, that's going to have a huge impact on income inequality. And so, and we could do more, by the way, to re- reduce world inequality by allowing more people from India and China and Africa into the United States and Canada. That would do a lot. That would do more than any of these other things we're talking about. We're also making people in India, in the United States and Canada better off. We have now people 
to hire to do our gardening. We have cheaper restaurants. We maybe get some of the brain drain, et cetera. I, I got a little sidetracked because you didn't ask about that. You asked, oh, do I see it continuing? Probably. In other words, I think that China's economy will cool off, their growth rate will fall, but I still think their growth rate will be substantially above ours for a number of years. So, yeah, I do see that continuing, and similar with India, I think, although I'm less, I'm less bullish on India than on China. So, so given all this, uh, what, what should people be thinking about if not income inequality? Uh, two, three things. How to make everyone better off. It's within that, the second is how especially to make lower income and less wealthy people better off. And third, how to get more economic freedom. And finding that Venn diagram of things that make everyone better off, poor people better off, and more economic freedom, and pushing for those things. And I think that Venn diagram is very big. So, for example, if we got rid of the drug war, I I wrote a piece for Hoover titled The Bottom 1%, who I don't think get nearly the attention they should get. Because if you look at the number of people in prisons in the United States, they are roughly 1% of the adult population. And almost all of them have extremely low incomes. So the bottom 1%, if you included people in prison, which the census doesn't, but if you did, would be made up, at least 70 to 80% of them would be people in prison. And Of those, maybe half of them are in prison because of the drug war, maybe more than half. So if we ended the drug war, we would quit refilling the prisons with people like that. And a large part of what's going on in the black community in the United States is the black men being separated from their families due to the drug war, going to prison. So if you got rid of the drug war, you would do a lot for people in the bottom end. That would be my most important reform within the United States. The second would be to get rid of occupational licensing, which restricts the people going into various occupations in about 800 occupations. Now, that doesn't mean in one state there are 800 occupations that are restricted. What it does mean is there are 800 different occupations in which at least one state restricts entry. And the real expert on this, Morris Kleiner at the University of Minnesota, estimates that almost 30% of people who are working now in the United States are in jobs that they had to get permission to be in. And permission is often very difficult to get. And we're not just talking about doctors and lawyers, and I will make the case, as Milton Friedman did, for not restricting entry into that profession also. But even things like hairdressers, even things like interior designers, even tree surgeons, you name the occupation within that 800, and as I said, there's at least one state that's restricting supply. Make that easier for people to enter, and people can enter that occupation who otherwise wouldn't be able to. And that would do a lot for people at the bottom end. Now, I'm not saying there are going to be all these people in the bottom fifth who are going to become entrepreneurs. Some of them would. But more important, the ones who would become entrepreneurs can hire some of the people in the bottom fifth. So, for instance, it would be a lot easier for me to create a haircutting salon if more people were allowed to become haircutters, self-taught haircutters, unlicensed haircutters. And so... Not only do the haircutters, the people who get to become haircutters, benefit, but their employers do, and the people who need haircuts, which is most people. Right, right. By the way, there's a, a philosophy professor at, in, at Georgetown Law School, Georgetown University Law School, named Peter Jaworski. He's actually Canadian. Are you familiar with him? Uh, I believe I've seen him. I've seen videos of him on the internet. So a friend of mine told me this story. I met him for my first time at a conference a few months ago, and I should have asked him if the story was true, but the friend is a very close friend of his, so I'm assuming it is, that in his, in his um, business ethics class, he has the students come up with a project, some business that makes sense to start. 
and then they go out and research it. And a large percent of them come back as libertarians. <laughs> and the reason is that they are outraged when they find out that this business that makes total sense would violate and laws where in is a large number. And they can't get it to, you know, they can't get it off the ground because of all the laws they'd have to comply with. Yeah, you, you don't you don't really know about red tape until you try to try to get through it and then it's everywhere. That's right. And I'm in one of the I'm one of the lucky ones because I'm an academic. Uh, no one yet is restricting what I can write. I you know, can write about, think about anything I want. And there aren't a lot of restrictions on what I can do, and that's pretty rare nowadays. But, of course, the, the, the problem is that uh, academics are some of the people who maybe shape the people's ideas about the world around them, and if we're not encountering any sort of bureaucracy, then maybe we're a little blind to it. That's a really good point. I remember I wrote a... There was a fam- well-known economist at University of Chicago in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, named Yale Brosen, and he wrote some excellent pieces. And when I was at, at the Cato Institute in 1979, I put these pieces together in a in a in a monograph, and it was titled "Is Government the Source of Monopoly?" And in my preface, I told the following story: and a, an economist friend who, like me, had graduated from UCLA. Well, we studied these things. We studied the various regulations. And it was a very, it was a very practical economics uh, education in that sense. I was talking to a colleague of his at UC Santa Barbara the, on the faculty that he went to, and he was telling how in order to run a trucking company, you had to get a license, and you had to have a license to ship specific goods between specific points A and B. And if you wanted to stop at part C, point C on the way, tough, you aren't allowed to. And the person said, oh, that can't be. <laughs> and this other economist said that. Not a philosophy professor, not a psychologist. But another economist with a Ph.D. said, oh, that can't be. Well, of course, that was. It was the Interstate Commerce Commission. They did have those restrictions. One of the big triumphs of the Carter administration, which actually followed on earlier initiatives in the, in the Nixon and Ford administrations, was to deregulate trucking so that people didn't have to get permission. And we saw a dramatic change for the better in, in surface transportation once deregulation happened. Rates came down, quality improved, people didn't have to get permission, etc. Do you have any final thoughts about inequality? Just, I think the best thought I gave as a potential final one is quit thinking about it. You know, don't <laughs> think about what you really want. If you want people to be better off, think about things that will make them better off and forget about inequality or equality as an end in itself. My guest today has been David Henderson. David, thanks for being on Economics Detective Radio. Thanks, Garrett. Well, thanks for listening to that episode of Economics Detective Radio. I know David mentioned a lot of books and articles, and before you scroll back in the episode to try to Google them, you can head over to the show notes page for the episode at economicsdetective.com slash inequality, where I'll have detailed notes and links to everything we mentioned, every book, every article, and you can... If you decide to buy one of those books, you can click through my Amazon link and then I'll get a small commission on the sale at no cost to yourself. That's a great way to support the podcast. The other great way to support the podcast is through Patreon, which is a crowdfunding website that allows you to make a small ongoing donation per podcast episode up to a monthly limit so you don't break the bank if I decide to turn it into a daily show. I'm not planning on that, but you never know. I release uh, some bonus content for each episode. I call it my afterthoughts episodes where I do about 15 minutes of just my sort of reflections on the episode and just bonus content for the people who support me. Uh, and you can get exclusive access to those through the Patreon page. Again, patreon.com slash economicsdetective. So head on over to 
the show notes page, economicsdetective.com slash inequality. And if you really want to support me, you can head over to patreon.com slash economicsdetective. Thanks, and I hope you'll listen again soon.